Hello and welcome everybody. This is Heather Pratt with Thriving with Lyme. I'm so excited to bring you another Lyme success story today. Today I'm going to be interviewing Beth Schultz and um, she is a nutritional therapy practitioner and certified gluten practitioner and has a long journey that she wants to share with you about dealing with MS and Lyme. So Welcome, Beth. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for having me. Um, so let's just jump into it. Um, tell us how long you've had Lyme um, and MS, because it goes hand in hand with you, and how long um, did you have it maybe before you were diagnosed? Just kind of give us the, the details, your background, because everybody wants to know, you know kind of what you, where you were, and then we'll go all the way to where you are now. All right. I was, um, I was diagnosed with MS 13 years ago. Probably four months before that, um, I was at a lake in central Oregon, and I watched a deer fly bite me. Now, I know that they say a tick is the only way to get Lyme disease from the CDC. Um, I will say Dr. Stephen Buhner's new book, Healing with Lyme, very clearly states that you can get Lyme from other biting insects. Um, so I watched the deer fly bite me. The next morning, I had a perfect bullseye rash. I knew a bullseye rash meant Lyme disease, but it was a deer fly that bit me. We supposedly don't have Lyme disease in Oregon, so I completely ignored it. Um, I don't remember any symptoms right away, but then again, looking back from 13, I lost so much of my memory that I don't know if I would remember that. Um, probably about four months after that, I was in Colorado on vacation and I lost partial eyesight. It felt like a migraine. I got a headache at first. I had a cold. Um, I took some migraine medication and the headache went away, but the ocular part of the migraine never went away. I waited about a week and I finally went to urgent care um, where they gave me an injection of an MS medication, or MS, sorry, migraine medication, and left me in a dark room for 30 minutes. They came back in and asked me if my eyesight was better. It was no better. So they, um, they had an ophthalmology department. They sent me right up to the ophthalmologist. She looked into my eyes and said, this looks like optic neuritis. And optic neuritis is normally multiple sclerosis. Um, honestly, at that time, I don't think I knew what MS was. I thought MS meant you were in a wheelchair. And so I was just floored <laughs> by her. Um, they, they dilated my eyes and sent me on my way to go pick up my five-year-old daughter after telling me they think I have MS. I can't see anything. Um, I get into my car and I did drive a couple blocks just hysterically crying and decided I should probably pull over because <laughs> I couldn't see and I was upset. Um, a friend went and picked up my daughter for me. Um, I was lucky to get into a neurologist the very next day. Um, we had an MRI first, and then I went to my neurologist. There was no lesions on my brain at that time, just a lesion on my eye nerve. Um, to be diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, you need multiple lesions. Um, so the neurologist said, hopefully this will be an isolated incident, and everything will be okay. Um, in about two months, my eyesight came back. I was ecstatic. A few days later, I lost eyesight in the other eye. Um, I went back to the neurologist, had a new MRI done, and this time I had a lesion on my brain, two or three on my spine, and another lesion on my other eye nerve. Mm. Um, they did do a lot of blood testing, and they sent me for a spinal tap. Um, the spinal tap revealed that I had obliglongical bands in my, in my spinal fluid, which they say is only a sign of MS. But if you look on Wikipedia, it even says that it's a sign of Lyme disease. Oh, wow. um, at this time, they told me that I did test positive for Lyme disease. I didn't know I had been tested. And he had even sent the test in for a second test to be sure, and it came back positive the second time too. Um, but he said that we don't have Lyme disease in Oregon. So I didn't have it. So that had been, he had tested me two months before that and it had come back positive and he never said a word to me about it. Um, he decided to test me for a third time and the third time it came back <laughs> CDC positive again. And even yeah. on the ELISA, I'm CDC positive. Um, he had been again just said, you can't have Lyme disease in Oregon. Um, at that time, my local health department called me and said that I had Lyme disease. Um, they said, you do not get three positive Lyme disease tests without having Lyme disease. They offered to call my doctor and see if he just didn't understand how to treat Lyme disease. I don't think that made my neurologist very happy at all. Um, 
<laughs> so he called me into the office and he did give me 28 days of doxycycline and told me that I was never allowed to say Lyme disease in his office again. Wow. And that was, and that was what, 13 years ago? That was 13 years ago. Oh, okay. Um, at that time, I did not like his response. So I made an appointment in Portland with an MS, um, I can't, like an MS center at OHSU that is definitely the best place for MS in Oregon. Um, I went there. It's like a full six hour appointment all day. Your case gets shown to like seven different MS specialists and they all review it. And out of the seven, six of them said that you could not have Lyme disease and MS at the same time. Oh. Um, one, the doctor I ended up going with did say, I don't understand why somebody with MS would be immune to Lyme disease. <laughs> it makes no sense. So at that time, they decided to send my blood to an East Coast lab because they figured an East Coast lab would be better. And if it came back positive, then they would send me to an infectious disease doctor at OHSU, which was supposedly the best in Oregon. Um, of course, it came back positive. Um, me and my husband drive back to Portland. It was about a three-hour drive, so I have to take time off work, find a babysitter for my child, get a hotel. Um, yeah. We do that. We go to Portland, and in the morning, the doctor calls and cancels my appointment. <laughs> and I said, why are we canceling my appointment? And they said, well, because he knows you don't have Lyme disease. And I was like, how would he ever know I don't have Lyme disease? He's just looking at a file that has four CDC positive Lyme disease tests in it. Wow. Like, I have no, like, how can he know that? Because the only thing he knows is I have, or should know is that I have Lyme disease because it's positive. Um, I threw a little bit of a fit and he agreed to have a phone conversation with me at another time. So it probably took him about a month to call me. And on that phone conversation, he, ha he told me that I have what he likes to call LymeDisease.com. If I got off the internet and stopped reading about it, it would go away. Um, I was, how insulting is that? <laughs> yeah. And there really isn't like, even 15 years ago, there probably wasn't like a lot of stuff on the internet, really. I no, don't know. There really, there was nothing. Yeah, there's not a lot of stuff now. I mean, there's some stuff, but um, there probably wasn't even a lot back then. Definitely probably not any support groups back then. Um, no, there was only MS support groups and I was in an MS support group and I would ask about Lyme disease and all, they would shut me down. They would say, if you have Lyme disease, get out of this group. Wow. And I'm like, but I don't know if I have Lyme disease or I have MS. Like, can we not talk about this? And I actually, so I became very good friends with um, a gentleman from the East Coast that had a diagnosis of MS. And he actually flew out to Oregon to see me. I flew out to Connecticut to see him. Um, and that's kind of how I learned about Connecticut and Lyme disease. Um, so that was, it probably took me another year to decide that I had to go and see a doctor who knew about Lyme disease. So I flew to the East Coast and I found a neurologist there that was familiar with both of them. He looked at my chart and was floored. He's like, this is so obvious that you have Lyme disease. But he, he really believes, he's like, but you have MS. Your Lyme disease caused MS. There's no real difference in any of this. Um, so that was, he ordered me 90 days of IV antibiotics. Um, and this was actually, so I had a neurologist in Oregon at that time who said he would be open to discuss Lyme disease, but he didn't know enough about Lyme disease to make a diagnosis. And if I had a doctor that did, he would follow his guidelines. So I spent, that was thousands of dollars to fly out yeah. to the East Coast, pay cash for an appointment. Um, I did that. I come back to Oregon with my prescription. I'm so excited. I make an appointment with my neurologist, me and my husband. Um, he wasn't my husband at the time. Me and my boyfriend go in together. And he just keeps talking about MS and he's trying to push this new MS drug on me. And I was like, I'm really not interested. And did you get the paperwork from the doctor in Connecticut? And he goes, oh, that. And he's like, yeah. He's like, I saw, I saw that. He faxed me. And he's like, I, I'm so disrespected that he thought he could just fax something like that to me that I can't listen to anything he has to say. Wow. And <laughs> I lost it. I, um. Yeah. We were escorted out of the doctor's office and told we were never allowed to come back again because I had spent wow. thousands, like that was like everything I had to get myself better. Yeah. 
and now nobody was going to write this prescription for me as if or like actually fulfill it because oh, yeah. he wrote it but it couldn't be fulfilled with the ivs and the pick line like i had to have a local doctor oversee it um so thank goodness my primary care doctor who was just actually a nurse practitioner i shouldn't say just because she is the only person who ever listened to me oh, and would let me tell her what was going on and believed me. She didn't look at me like I was crazy. Um, yeah. So she got me the IV antibiotics, but that took at least another four or five months yeah. for insurance companies to agree to pay for it and to actually get it done. Um, well, I should say, so before I even did this, I tried one more doctor in Oregon to see, because he had treated my friend with Lyme disease and he yeah. treated her very well. He worked with an East Coast doctor. They did a year long antibiotic treatment years before that, that I really thought this gentleman would help me. So I go into his office and I sit down and I bring all my tests and I say Lyme disease and he turns pale white mm. and just looks at me and was like, get her out of my, or like he wasn't going to help me. And he told me that I 100% had MS. It could not be Lyme disease. And it, it ends up that in my medical chart, he diagnosed me with three different mental disorders. Oh my goodness for that saying that I had an obsession regarding alternative diagnosis. Um, I can't remember the other two. It was ridiculous. It was ridiculous because all I had was positive tests. Yeah. You're just and trying to fight for your life really and fight for care. Mm -hmm. And if I it truly like we all, I think all of us with Lyme end up being obsessed almost in a way because we want to get better. And you're almost like, how could there be, how come doctors can't figure it out? You know, so we're, we do get obsessed in a way like I want to yeah. be healthy. Especially if you've been healthy in the past, so you know what it feels like to feel good. And you're like, something's not right here. No, like one doctor told me, he said, well, I don't believe in Lyme disease. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't believe in Lyme disease? It's a bacteria that you can see under a microscope. Yeah. It's not like I'm asking you to believe in a religion. Yeah. Like it is a bacteria. There is science behind it. It is. Yeah. It's really ridiculous to me, yeah. um, honestly. So, you know, I did, I finally got those um, 90 days IV antibiotics and they messed up and ended up giving me 100 days, <laughs> yeah, oh, which was nice. Um, and that was, that experience was really, really rough. Like I truly, I don't remember that 100 days of my life. I was so incredibly sick. Um, I owned a business at the time. And the day that I started them, my business partner went out of town for a four month trip. So I had a business all to myself. The, I inject these medications and I am so incredibly sick. Wow. Um, I spent that four months in bed. I would work. Luckily, the office was at my house. So I just had to put on a pair of clean pajamas every morning and drag my butt out to work. And sadly, I hired a girl to help me out. And she acted like a great support system and she could do everything while she was stealing thousands of dollars from us that whole time. And I was so sick that I didn't notice when my partner got home and looked at the books. He's like, we have no money, like no money. <laughs> Where did all. And he's like, this is you made such a profit while I was gone. You did like an incredible job making money, but it's all gone. Wow. Um, so that was no fun. I actually. So when you're doing like IV Rosefin, you're supposed to inject it really slowly every time you do it and one I it was probably on it for about two or three weeks and you always give yourself an injection of like a saline first to clean out your line and then put in the rosefin well the the first one goes in really fast so then i was doing the rosefin and i just shot it in yeah. really fast well then i became allergic to it oh, because yeah. of that and so i asked my doctor if we could switch and nobody knew anything else to give me so my options were to stay on it and do allergy medication hard hardcore allergy medication or not do it at all so i think the allergy medication almost is why i don't remember anything from yeah, yeah. that and time like you're in that depth of healing and you're so out of it your, your brain is not working right and your the brain fog is so immense that yeah you can't remember <laughs> and yeah that was 10 years ago like diet nobody ever said a word about diet they don't even anymore but I, i'm not i'm not here to complain here to story. <laughs> probiotics <laughs> I wasn't on a probiotic. Yeah, wow. Even with wow. those antibiotics. Um, wow. and but you know, after that hundred days, I actually came out of a fog. And I thought that was it. Like I was perfectly okay with living. I don't think I was one hundred percent, but I was good enough that I would have lived like that forever. Um, mm -hmm. 
so we got married. We had a baby right away. Um, I still, even though I felt like I was in remission, it still did worry me to have a baby knowing that I had Lyme disease. And I think I had, um, the movie Under Our Skin had just come out where they talked about passing it to a baby. So I was very lucky. I had a Lyme doctor who refer referred me to, oh my gosh, now I cannot remember his name. Can you think of the pediatric Lyme doctor? I don't remember his name, but I, I see his face in my mind, but the one really, post, right? I really want to remember. Yeah, because he is like the leader for children's Lyme disease. Um, oh my gosh, I'll, I'll remember his name. But even like he, he called me, my doctor called him to talk about my case. And he just called me out of the blue and offered me free help, which I felt was so amazing to do. And then also Dr. Jimsek called me just out of the blue, because this was gosh, 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, all three of them recommended antibiotics while I was pregnant. I think I did amoxicillin. And one big thing they all three recommended was absolutely no vaccines for my daughter. Wow. And they said, you know, like she, she's going to have, she has a dormant bug in her somewhere. Yeah. And they truly believe that a vaccine would have been, would have taken out her immune system and she couldn't have fought it. So she has no vaccines and she is nine years old and she is completely healthy. Yeah. Um, she does have gut issues because yeah. of being, she was born on antibiotics. Yeah. Um, and at that time, the CDC would not admit that you could give Lyme to a baby. Mm -hmm. So I, um, my, my OB thought I was being a little bit silly about it, um, but she dealt with it. And then a week before my daughter was born, the CDC changed their website to say, you can't yeah. give it to a baby, make sure you treat while you're pregnant. And she was so gracious about it. And she's like, I'm just so glad you didn't listen to me. And you, you know, you listened to yourself and you made the best call for your baby. And so then she did, was willing to call my Lyme doctor and get recommendations. Um, so we did IV antibiotics at the birth too. And we tested her cord blood and her placenta when she was born. And those were all negative. Yeah. And that's um, so good that you listen to your, you know, your natural instincts. Um, um, I know I had three kids since having Lyme, but I didn't know I had Lyme. I was undiagnosed. And I just intuitively refuse any, um, any vaccinations for my kids. And I'm so thankful, so thankful. I listened to my heart on that one because yeah, 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 because it knows. <laughs> well, Dr. Klinghart sees a lot of his patients with autism. When he starts asking the mom questions about her health, they have autoimmune issues. Yeah. They test him for Lyme disease and the mom had Lyme disease. And yeah. then she vaccinated the baby and that was the final straw. Yeah. I've, yeah, I hear, I hear it now over and over and over. And so I'm just like, oh, I'm so thankful. I just intuitively kind of knew what to do, even though I didn't have a, um, I didn't know I had lines then, but I knew, I knew something was wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. I feel blessed that, you know, my daughter is healthy and her gut issues are livable. It's livable. She just can't eat gluten. She doesn't do very well, even with gluten-free grains. So like we do some, we let her have some gluten-free bread, but it's just never, it's never yeah. great for her. Even oatmeal, oatmeal is not good for her. Yeah. Um, but she does great on vegetables, meat, and fruit. <laughs> so that works. You're doing part soon. So, okay. So you're to the part of your story where you have, you got married, you have a little one. Mm -hmm. Symptoms are manageable. Um, I, yeah, I felt great until the day I went back to work when she was two months old, I went to work and I lost feeling in my legs completely. It was completely gone. Um, I was breastfeeding her at the time, but she was crying every day, all day. And somehow I don't know how we didn't put together that I was feeding, breastfeeding her with antibiotics. Um, I came in from work that day and I looked at her and I was like, I can't feed her. I just can't, like, I do not, I can't feel my legs whatsoever. This is back. I do not want to give this to her. Um, we gave her a bottle and she stopped crying. Yeah. <laughs> it was beautiful. And she had another bottle that night and she slept, she slept that night without crying all night long. Um, and so I go back to my neurologist and I say, can I have IV antibiotics again? And she just laughed at me <laughs> and said, no, because wow. you never had Lyme disease to begin with. Um, so once again, no doctor would help me out at all. So back on an airplane, I flew to Connecticut to see my doctor. 
And that was the hardest trip ever. I was walking with a cane. My flight got delayed. At one time, like I just laid on the, or like I sat on the ground in customer service and cried. It was like, yeah. you have to help me. And they finally got me on a flight to get, cause I wasn't going to make my doctor's appointment. I was in the middle of nowhere and wasn't going to even get to my destination before my doctor's appointment. So I'm like, then I just need to go home. Like there's no reason to fly to Connecticut and miss my doctor's appointment. So that was a terrible trip. Um, it was an interesting appointment though, because he retested me for Lyme disease. And for the first time I was negative yeah. um, for Lyme disease, but that time he, then he did a big like co-pan, you know, or co-infection panel. Yeah. And I had chlamydia pneumonia was the biggest one that he was worried about. And you mm -hmm. can find um, a lot of people with multiple sclerosis have chlamydia pneumonia. So he put me on a three-year combination antibiotic protocol for chlamydia pneumonia. Wow. Um, I did that three years. I was not better hmm. after three years. So they just kept giving me the same antibiotics that I was taking still. Nobody ever talked about diet, <laughs> probiotics, none of it. Um, what, was your, what, what would you say your standard diet was at that time of your life? <sighs> oh, I just ate whatever I wanted to. I owned, the company I owned was a restaurant delivery company. And so we delivered food for 25 different restaurants. So I ate a lot of restaurant food. Okay. And my husband was a great cook and my husband really wanted to cook healthy and I wanted nothing to do with it. Oh. So like we did, like my, my daughter never had, all of her food was organic when she started eating food. He stayed home with her while I worked. Um, he made, she never had one jar of baby food. He made all of her baby food, but I wasn't into the healthy thing. So, and he fed me what I wanted. I was crabby about my food. I drank a can of Coke with every meal. Oh. Um, if we would run out of Coke, he would come. Cause, and I didn't, we never ate dinner at our kitchen table. I ate dinner in bed every night. He brought me dinner and he would come in and he'd be like, Oh, we don't have any Coke. And I'd just look at him and he'd be like, but I'm running to the store right now to get it. <laughs> like, I was a crabby mean person. Really. I was just, I was sick and crabby. Um, I had tried, I shouldn't say that because I had tried to be a vegetarian at one time because that was, that is the, was the one diet for MS was a low fat diet. Mm -hmm. um, so I tried that and it did nothing for me. So I didn't feel yeah. that, you know, it would be helpful at all. Um, after probably about four years into doing antibiotics again, I was vomiting every day for hours. I would just wake up and just vomit. Um, so I stopped the antibiotics and I really decided like, I'm just going to be blind and in a wheelchair one day. Oh. There's nothing I can do. Um, Cause I think my, my biggest symptoms was my eyesight, um, losing feeling in my legs, my left, just my left arm would be numb for months at a time. Um, incredible headaches and brain fog. Like I couldn't read a book and understood, stand what it said. Yeah. Um, I could work and do like the things I already knew how to do, but I couldn't do anything new, if that makes sense. Like yeah. learn anything new. Yeah. Um, so I totally gave up. And one day my friend says, you know, I'm going, a, a friend of mine started to become really sick and I knew she had Lyme disease. Yeah. And of course she tested negative for Lyme disease and nobody was helping her. So her husband started to try to find alternative people. And she said, I'm going to this iridologist. Do you want to come with me and meet this lady? I hear it's really cool. Do you, have you heard of iridology? Yeah. I, yeah. And actually we found a place um, up north of us. We're waiting to make an appointment. But, okay. Uh, no, that's our, we haven't seen one yet, but I'm excited. Yeah. Um, so iridology, they study the iris of your eye and they say that they can see your past, present and future health issues. Yeah. It sounds totally nuts, but we sat down with this woman and my friend and she knew every, like she coined her, or like she knew things that nobody could ever know. Wow. Um, and she was right on. And she said she could, didn't see Lyme disease, but she saw bacteria and she saw parasites. Huh. Um, once my friend started working with her and like doing some herbs and cleansing, she tested positive for Lyme disease. Wow. Um, and so then I made an appointment with the woman and gosh, I think it was like $90 and you would spend three and a half hours at her house. Yeah. And she looked in my eyes and she's like, oh, it's all your, it's just your digestive system. Like you have some parasites and stuff, but we just need to fix your digestive system and you'll be fine. And I was like, wow, that just sounds crazy. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I had nothing to loot. Like there was just nothing else to do. 
Yeah. Um, her, she really likes a vegan diet. She thinks the vegan diet is the only way to be healthy. I think she's actually changed a little bit <laughs> since then. Um, so we did it. We did the full on vegan diet for nine months, I would say. Um, we did at one time we did the master cleanse, 10 days of drinking nothing but water, maple syrup, cayenne and lemon. Um, that was an intense 10 days. And we also, during that 10 days, I would go every day and have colimas done, I would, um, which yeah. is like a colonic every day for 10 days with antiparasitic herbs. Yeah, that was, it's, hard, um, yeah, it's hardcore. It was a hardcore <laughs> 10 days. And actually, so right before this happened, she waits like months of working with you before she says any of this. Um, and so she says, well, now we're going to do this 10 day fast and you have to get off every one of your prescription medications. Oh. Um, at the time I had taken Vicodin, Xanax, Valium, antidepressants, sleeping aids every single day of my life, except for when I was pregnant wow. for, it had been what, like eight years. Wow. So when she told me that I had to give up my Vicodin, it's not like, it's not like I was a drug addict, but I was addicted to those drugs. Yeah. Yeah, I believe it. Um, so I looked at her and I looked at my husband and we left <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm never going back there again. <laughs> like, we'll just never talk to that lady again. She's crazy. <laughs> he was like, no, honey, those are the drugs talking. Like, you just don't wow. want to give up your drugs and you yeah. have to. Um, mm -hmm. That was like, that was a very hard realization for me because it was the yeah. first time I really had to look at it and go, oh my gosh, I am a drug addict. Or like, yeah. I am addicted. Yeah, you're, you're addicted. Yeah, addiction. Yeah. Um, like sugar addiction. Ah. Mm -hmm. And in the yeah. sleep part, like that was scary because I truly did not sleep. Like if I didn't take my Xanax and my sleeping pill, I didn't sleep at all. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I looked for some alternatives and I went and met with her again and said, can I take cannabis oil? Can I take mm -hmm. a high dose cannabis oil? And at that time she was not okay with cannabis. She really considered it a drug. And I was like, you know, it, it is a drug, but it's a plant that grows and you like herbs. And she's like, okay, like, I guess I can be okay with that. It's better yeah. than nothing. And so I was able to wean off all my medicine in a pretty short time and replace it with cannabis oil. I slept through the night. It was, it worked perfectly yeah. for me. And that's why you're doing the master cleanse? Um, well, the mat, it was mostly for parasites. Okay. Okay. The master cleanse and detox and the parasites that came out of me. Do that master cleanse. Then she told you to get off all. all nope. That. I had to get off the drugs before the master cleanse. Okay. okay. I follow you. Um, so it was like, that was a really tough week. Like I gave up all my yeah. drugs and I didn't eat for 10 days. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. But you know, I mean, when you're really sick, you need like, you need to treat it very, very seriously. You do. Well, and you know, somehow the 10 days was not horrible or like somehow that lemon and maple syrup like fills you up every time you take a sip of it or like the first three days were tough and then it wasn't so bad. Um, during that 10 days though, cause I would go to her house every day and do the Colimas and like, I had a couple nervous breakdowns on her table and she is just like, this woman has this spirit about her that is just so loving and kind and <laughs> I don't know if she just, she would talk me down. And I think like that is, um, I'll be honest, like I was not a religious person before and I wouldn't actually call myself necessarily a religious person. Um, I am a Christian and I believe, but like I didn't believe in God at that time. And I had a full on realization and like I found God and that was a really big That's part cool. of my healing, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think during that detox, no matter what your body's going through as far <clears throat> detox goes, I think as we detox, we almost have to detox emotions too. Like when you're detoxing your body, emotions come up and it's like, you got to work through them. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. And we're all, I, I never realized, I mean, it's like I knew up here, but I didn't know my whole body, like how much our gut health and our mind and everything is so connected to our health. And just, I learned something new all the time now. I think, you know, going, dealing with being sick, I guess, well, or being healthy. Yeah. yeah. Dealing with having Lyme, you have to you have to dig through a lot of junk. You really do, and yeah, I I came to a lot of realizations in that ten days and had to let go of a lot of stuff and accept a lot of stuff from my life and accept that it happened and you can't go back and change it. You just have to ask for forgiveness and move on, and you have to. I love. Um, I think this was this was right about the same time 
that we did this cleanse, she looked at me and she said, you know, I'm getting really busy with clients and I need you to answer three questions if I'm going to continue to be your practitioner. Sure. Do you want to get better? And I said, oh, yes. She said, do you believe you can get better? Yes, I do. Or like, and at one time I would have said no to that question, but at this, yeah. like, I had had enough healing that I said, yes, I can. And she said, are you willing to do whatever it takes to get better? And I mm -hmm. said, yes. And she said, thank you. Because, and she's like, truly, I'm not working with anybody anymore who can't answer yes to those three questions. Yeah. Because if you don't believe you're going to get better, you're never going to get better. Yeah. If you're not willing to do whatever it takes, you're not going to get better. Yep. That's the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was just an amazing thing. And after that, like I did, I felt so much better. Um, but there was just, I had been a vegan when I was, right before I got pregnant with my oldest child, and I got very, very depressed. I can be almost vegetarian and be okay, but I cannot be a vegan. And yeah. so, like, I was feeling better, but I could just feel that depression kicking back in to my brain of just something missing. And yeah, and you were doing, well, you're doing vegan, but were you doing grains at the time? I was doing grains yeah. at the time. Um was I wasn't doing gluten, but I was doing grains. Mm -hmm. And I went on a vacation with my family, and me and my mom were looking at Facebook, and Dr. Wall's video popped up. And um, we pressed play on the video for some reason because it was somebody who got over their MS. Mm -hmm. And we watched this 17 minute video, and like it just like my favorite number at the time was 1111. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And eleven eleven pops up on the screen of the TED Talk right when it pops up, and like wow. I don't know, there was just something about it. I was like, I I think this is my thing. Yeah, connection. And the um, I didn't really know what the paleo diet was even. So I and Dr. Wall's book wasn't out at the time. Mm. And so I um, there was a woman who had a paleo food company in Bend. So I sent her an email and asked her if she had any suggestions. Um, she told me to get the book Practical Paleo by Diane Sanfilippo. Mm -hmm. And I ordered that book. It showed up as we were getting on an airplane to go to Texas to visit family. I had like, no, I wasn't going to change my diet or do anything. But I put the book in my carry on and I started reading it. And like, she just goes into why you wouldn't eat grains and gluten and legumes and dairy. And like this, the first part of her book is life changing, in my opinion. She explains it so well and so easily. And I was like, I am just never, ever eating grains again. Like, this is it. And like, I'm doing this diet. And I started that day on vacation. My family looked at me like, what is this crazy diet that you're doing? Like, that's crazy. They had just realized their daughter had gluten issues. So they had all kind of just went gluten free, but they thought this paleo thing was crazy. Um, I did it. And it was funny. We get home and there was a message from them and they're like call us back right away and i can't remember what movie they watched but they watched some movie while we were on our plane and they're like you are right actually like we're all doing this paleo diet right now this, <laughs> like this sounds great and all their health has improved greatly wow. <laughs> um i think my step my sister-in-law had not um she had had such severe heartburn her whole life she was mm -hmm. one of like the very first person to be on i can't Prevacid, maybe like one of the really big things. She was on their clinical mm -hmm. trial. She hadn't been able to eat past seven o'clock at night in years wow. and sleep. And within a month, she has no more heartburn. She can mm -hmm. eat whatever she wants, like no more medications for heartburn. She's perfectly fine. It was gluten the whole time. <laughs> um, within four months of starting that diet, I was in complete remission. I had lost a hundred pounds and I felt fabulous. I could hike up mountains again. And yeah, that's kind of, that's my story. <laughs> that's my story. Um, <laughs> we kind of worked through what treatment did you try? Everything under the sun almost. Um, Russ worked, we went through that stuff. I'm looking at my cheat sheet over here. Um, so let's go into like, what would you say to people dealing with Lyme or, or MS or, or both? Um, I think a lot of people with Lyme have a lot of MS um, symptoms. Like I know myself, I was tested for MS, but it came, they said, well, it looks like you have it, but I didn't have enough of the lesions to, to get diagnosed, but definitely a lot of the same um, symptoms. So I kind of put them in the same category sometimes from my own experience. Um, but what would you say to everyone out there who's listening? Who will be listening to this that has Lyme or MS and they're really in that 
place where they don't really have a lot of hope. So what would you say to them to like give them hope and know that things can get better? But I think you, you did say a little bit about like you have to take action. You have to believe it, you know, in your heart, in your mind, your whole soul, and also be willing to take that step. Be willing to um, know that people might ridicule you or say, what's this diet you're doing? Why is this doing, you know? Say, why are you doing all these extreme things? Or why don't you do this? Oh, it's just one cookie. Like, can't you just indulge a little bit? Like, live a little. We hear that a lot. Live a little. It's just a cookie. <laughs> it is not just a cookie. When you're healing, like, gluten is the one thing I cannot touch. I had, um, so after I did recover, I ate at a restaurant one day. And it was in Portland. It is a restaurant that is so gluten-free friendly, but yet they do have gluten buns. Um, the owner actually follows a autoimmune paleo diet for his arthritis and has recovered. And I'm eating my French fries, they're sweet potato fries, they're baked, so they're not fried. And something in them were really crunchy and different and didn't like, there was something weird. I didn't think much of it. I stood up to leave and my eyesight went. Like wow. it was that optic neuritis was there and my balance, like I had a hard time walking out to my car. I got in my car and was like, what the, f <laughs> what yeah. just happened to me? And I was like, oh my God, it had to have been gluten. Like, I don't know what it is. And I was um, actually going to a nutritional therapy conference. I had to, I had never had a panic attack driving before in my life. I get in my car and I have to drive over this double decker bridge in Portland. And I lost it. The panic attack that I had on that bridge, like I almost couldn't, it was rush hour traffic. So the car wasn't moving very, like I almost couldn't drive over the bridge. It, like I was just, I wanted to stop my car and have a police officer come and drive me, but I had to get off the bridge. So I, I made yeah. it. Um, it was horrible. And I made it through the weekend, not like just feeling off and weird. And when I got home, I lost feeling in my legs again. And it lasted for nine months. Wow. And that was one bite of gluten. Wow. So like you can't say at that point that's not Lyme disease does that make you know like I didn't have that bite of gluten and my Lyme disease came back that was 100 percent an autoimmune inflammation, inflammation issue yeah. yeah um and that's where like somebody was telling me the other day that Lyme disease is only immunosuppressive and you know it may be immunosuppressive for some people but yeah. for me it is autoimmune yeah and I love um, the new book, D Dr. Buner's Healing with Lyme Disease, I think is such an incredible book because it doesn't just talk about his herbal protocol. Um, he is in support of antibiotics for people that need like that need them. But he makes it very clear, too, there is a certain percentage of people who are never going to get better on antibiotics. Yeah. And I am that person. Yeah. Um, at that, like, I think I had killed the Lyme years before that and it was it was just an immune issue and like I needed to feed my immune system so that it could take care of me and so like people doctors don't talk about nutrition that much and people don't nope. know and it matters but like how every cell in our body is fueled on nutrition every function in our body is fueled on nutrition we are grown on nutrition it is absolutely in my opinion should be the foundation of everything we do yeah. and if you choose antibiotics, if you choose herbs, if you choose essential oils, whatever you choose to do with your Lyme disease, nutrition should be the base. Yeah, I agree. And and really in the long run, it's actually cheaper because some people say, oh, it's so expensive to eat healthy. Yes, it is, but it's a lot cheaper than maybe not having to do as many herbs or as many antibiotics. Like, It's really cheaper and easy in the long run. It takes you have to make the choice. You can't just pop a pill. You have to do the effort to get yep. the results. But I honestly, even though it's more expensive diet than the standard American diet, it's actually cheaper than a lot of medications that you know, we're having to take or doctors are telling us to take. Yeah. And, you know, we do spend a lot of money on food, but we also, like, I spend a lot of money on Coca-Cola. And, like, yeah. we don't eat probably as much food as we used to eat because the food that we eat is so nutrient-dense that we don't have to fill ourselves with junk yeah, all the time. And then, so like you wanted to say what I think about healing and stuff like that is I believe the body wants to heal. The mm -hmm. body's like main mechanism in life is to heal, mm -hmm. yep. but you have to feed it the nutrients it needs to be able to do that. And you have to cleanse it from all of the toxins that we are constantly bombarded with in life. Like, mm -hmm. We live in a very toxic world, sadly. Yeah, yeah. And our skin, you know, like if I don't, if if I wouldn't eat it, I really don't put it on my skin. 
Yeah. Even. And yeah. like, I think I remember telling my friend one day, like when we got really into food, I was like, if I ever want to buy organic clothes, stop me. And <laughs> I will say I don't buy all organic clothes because I just can't afford it. And it would be really tough. But like, honestly, if I could afford all organic clothes, I would wear yeah. them. Yeah. Because yeah, no, that was that was part of my process too of um, my healing journey is yeah taking out chemicals out of our life whether that's cleaning cleaning stuff but also the makeup the lotions the shampoos the all the kind of stuff that is bombarded in our in our body and just like you get it on your skin yeah it absorbs right into our skin and so. Um, yeah. And this is a touchy subject. This will make some people mad sometimes. Like I see people wanting to get Lyme disease tattoos. And if you want to get it and your body does great with it, that's great. But I will, I have a big tattoo on my back. And when I, um, like when we did that master cleanse and we were doing, we, I would also do an ionic foot bath once a week and for red mm -hmm. sauna once a week, my tattoo will actually like almost, it feels like it's pulsating. Hmm. and it hurts and then I get like a week I get bumps all around it my body oh. hates that and I got my tattoo way before anybody would ever have thought about making inks without metals yeah and I'm sure you can find better inks but you also have to know the inks are not regulated yeah so if somebody says this yeah. is a natural ink it they can completely yeah. lie and get in no trouble yeah. um but I'm a tattoo like person I'm a tattoo person in multiple places but um, and some were after Lyme, but yeah, it was a choice. Like, does this mean enough to me to get, you know, chemicals or metals into my body? Yes, they are safer now, but yeah, it was like a choice. Like, am I willing to risk that, like putting more into my body and possibly having a side effect? But the ones, you know, for me, they're more of a personal, like to give me strength to get through all this, this stuff we're going through. But, but yeah, it's a hard, but you have to know, yeah, it's still chemical. It's still a foreign object in there. Yeah, well, and they just, um, I have a picture that I share a lot of a lymph node of a man who got a tattoo and then got lymph cancer from it. Yeah. And his lymph node is full of black to black tattoo ink. So that goes into your bot. Like, you do have to yeah. think about it. And people That's with... Because even the tooth work that you get, breast implants, anything, the IUD, yeah. anything that you put into your body that is not supposed to be there yeah. has, has a, can become an autoimmune issue because yeah. your body will fight it. Yeah. I think what happens, um, I know I've, I've, there's been a lot of controversy or a lot of talk lately about, um, people that have, they say they didn't get Lyme from the implants, but it triggered their Lyme to flare up. And most likely they had Lyme, but they got an implant, let's say put in and your body is so busy fighting this foreign invader in your body. Whether, yeah, whether it's an IUD or some other chemical or even a tattoo, but I heard about, you know, the breast implants, um, but that is so busy fighting this that it allowed bacterial and, and viruses and everything just to take over your body because it's so busy trying to take this foreign invader out of you, and it can't because it's synthetic and can't get out. Yep. <laughs> People are having things removed, you know, implants taken out because, yeah, you know, in their journey of getting better. And like I would love, I have mercury fillings and I got most of my mercury fillings after having, being diagnosed with MS. Oh wow. I don't know how, like, I don't know how it didn't cross my mind that that's mercury and not good for the neurological system. Yeah. Um, and I would, every time I went into that dentist, I would have a huge flare. If, even wow. if I get my teeth cleaned, I have a flare. Mm -hmm. But you know what, I did, I can't afford a good biological dentist, so I've never gotten mm -hmm. them out and I did recover so it's like and some people though that wouldn't be the case some people would have to get theirs out before they're going to recover but anybody who does that please be careful because even the very like I just had a client go to a great doctor to get it done and I believe that they did it all right but just enough mercury came went back into her system that all the gut healing that we had worked on is completely shot wow. and she's having a very very hard time overcoming that. Yeah. yeah, I got mine taken out about eight years ago, um, all the mercury fillings I had, but it, I actually didn't do a mercury um, detox, um, in, well, mercury and other metals detox until this year, and I, so I haven't had mer any mercury in my mouth for years, but I, I really could, I felt it coming out really? of my jaw, I could really, after about six weeks into it, I could feel it, um, yeah, coming out of my jaw, I'm like, what is that pain, but it was, it was mercury that had gotten in there, you know, from years and years ago, um, working its way out still. <laughs> yep. 
That's, yeah. oh, it's, yeah, it's scary. I have a friend who has cancer right now and um, he had just gotten titanium implants in his mouth and that is supposed to be the safest yeah. option to do. And now that they're looking at his healing, they're like, that is when it all started. Yeah. As soon as we put that foreign thing in his body, his health crashed and we're really hoping he could get it out and recover. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, I think we should talk about like digestion because, yeah. Yeah, talk uh, about you know, and we never, and then want to talk to you about how this has shaped, you know, your career really now after getting healthy, tell us more about how, um, you're a nutritional therapy practitioner and also the certified gluten practitioner and tell us how having Lyme, having MS, everything has really shaped, yeah, your career and what you do now, you're helping people heal and you're doing, you're doing awesome things. All right. we'll, <laughs> and then, we'll, we'll start yeah. with that. So I okay. just knew like when I was better and it was food that I, cause I truly, I did lots of things, but I just feel like food was my number one thing. So I just knew I had to, I had to share that and like I had to help other people. So I went to school at the Nutritional Therapy Association, which is out of Olympia, Washington. And they actually teach, um, it was mostly online. And then you just get, you have like three, um, long weekends of in-person classes and they have them all over the west coast um in australia hawaii canada i believe there's a few classes on the east coast so there's lots of opportunities um, for people to do this it was about a 10-month program um just very intensive it was they said that it would be about 20 hours a week um, I would say for me, it's like I can retain information now, but I still have to work harder, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So I would say I put in a good 40 hours a week going to school with them. I feel the program is amazing. It really focuses on bioindividuality and how there is no one diet for every person. And you really like, you really have to look at each person and what they need and what their deficiencies are. And there's just never one protocol for every person. Um, the biggest things that we focus on is digestion, blood sugar, hydration. I should know all of this stuff off my hand. <laughs> um, we're going to leave it at that right now. Um, I think, you know, number one, when I work with a client is digestion. Yeah. Because you can eat the very best diet in the world, but if you're not absorbing it, then it means not, you know, it means nothing. And people expect, I, I don't know if it is the Lyme disease eating our, our bacteria, like messing with our bacteria. I'm, it, well, it definitely is the Lyme disease yeah. is messing with our digestive system and then the antibiotics that we're doing yeah. and even the herbs, herbs are great, but or anything that's going to kill anything is going to kill everything. Yeah. There's still antibiotics, just natural antibiotics, but still yeah. anti-life. <laughs> and yeah, like you don't realize like we have more, more bacteria in our body than we have human cells. Yeah. And if you can't, like people will say glyphosate is safe for humans. If you want to say that, okay, like possibly maybe glyphosate would, hurt a human but it hurts bacteria and kills bacteria if we ingest glyphosate and it kills all the bacteria in our bodies then it hurts humans yeah, <laughs> right yeah. um and it's so hard to avoid G like gmos are in so much of the food that we eat today and i truly think that they are a big problem with people's health today um yeah. So that is a big part of my diet is not eating any GMOs, um, eating mostly organic, but fixing digestion, which can mean so many different things for each person. Um, like when I started, I had absolutely no hydrochloric acid. Mm -hmm. And, and that's if you don't, what I'm working on still. <laughs> if you don't have hydrochloric acid, you can't get your magnesium, your zinc, your B vitamins, you're not absorbing any of that. And so like people, if they're drinking alkaline water, that you can drink alkaline water, but never drink your alkaline water near your food, hmm. ever. You don't want an alkaline stomach. You want an acidic stomach and you eat the nutrients that you need. The acid breaks them up and then your body will regulate its pH just like it was designed to do. Yeah. And that, that stomach acid is also important to kill off any you know viruses or bacteria that could be making their way in. That's our first line of defense too, is killing those yep. things before they wreak havoc in our body. And parasites. Parasites is on all 
any real food is gonna it has a chance of having a parasite. It doesn't matter if you're a vegan, vegetarian, you eat meat all day long. It all ha can have parasites on it. Yeah. And you don't want to get like, I don't wash my vegetables in a crazy way. I want the bacteria mm -hmm. and, and the dirt and all of the good stuff from that to feed my butt, you know? Yeah. My bugs. You can't eat a sanitized diet yeah. either because our bodies aren't like that. Um, yeah. And yeah, people have H. pylori is such an issue. SIBO is becoming such an issue, and especially in the Lyme disease community. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think. And you recommend mostly uh, supplements or real food and doing so sauerkraut, uh, kefir, kombucha. What do you? What's your kind of go-to thing that you're telling your clients to do for their digestion? Well, it depends. Like if you have a histamine issue, you can't do sauerkraut. <laughs> you can't do kombucha. So you have to, you know, that's where each person has to be different. But if you can do those things, I think it's great. And then I really think when you slowly heal your digestive system, you can slowly get rid of histamine issues in a lot of cases. I had a histamine issue for not too long of a time. I really healed mine pretty fast by just working on healing my gut. Um, where like, I think bone broth is great, but bone broth might be too much glutamine and too much histamine for some people. Then I would recommend trying a really slow, um, short cook meat stock huh. instead, which like my, um, chicken soup recipe that you were going to do, that is primarily meat stock. You only cook the chicken for two hours instead of like a 12 hour bone broth, but you're still getting the benefits from that and the gaps book the gaps book is a great book for healing the digestive system too mm -hmm. um but so healing the gut i i don't think i would start with hydrochloric acid right away i think if apple cider vinegar is enough or even lemon juice to kind of get your digestive things flowing is a good choice but some people definitely need hydrochloric acid um so i would recommend doing a hydrochloric acid challenge test where you take one hydrochloric acid with each meal and a very low dose, like try to get something under 300 milligrams, 200 would be best. Um, and your second meal, you take two hydrochloric acids. If you don't have any heartburn, the third meal, you take three and you can gauge, I got up to 17. Wow. And yeah. at 17, I stopped because I was like, that's just ridiculous. Like that's scary, ridiculous. Yeah. And so I took, I took, huge high doses of hydrochloric acid for a good year and a half, two years probably, and wow. nothing was really changing. And then I remembered, I was like, oh, you can't make hydrochloric acid without zinc. You can't absorb zinc without hydrochloric acid. Mm. So what if I take a zinc pill with my hydrochloric acid every time? Mm. And within six months, I started getting heartburn because I started making hydrochloric acid and now I take, um, I still take a little bit of hydrochloric acid when I have a big meal, but that just a little bit. Yeah, that's good to know. Cause I know I, I take six of the higher, like 500 milligrams and I'm not getting any heartburn. I worked my way up to that and I'm like, I got to figure out something else. Okay. Out. When we're dealing with Lyme, we, we're all, we're trying to fix our thyroid, trying to fix our heart. We're trying to fix our hydrochloric acid. We're trying to fix so much at once. Even like I consider myself to be in remission. You know, I, I function. I have five children. I'm running around all day. I, I run, I walk, I go on hikes. Like I consider myself in remission. I have my bumps in the road, you know, with stress or if I eat something I know I shouldn't have eaten. Um, but I'm still, you're still like constantly balancing, you know, all these different levels. Like, okay, you know, stress induced this. So is that my adrenal glands getting out of whack or what, you know, you have to constantly see what organ needs to be focused on to do more deep, deep healing. It, it does. It takes, it's constant. It takes a while, but it's worth it. <laughs> it is. And, yeah. you know, we're like, I am in remission, but I have to, I still work at that remission. Like yeah. I can't, I can't eat gluten. I can't, yeah. um, I was, you know, and if I, I was, a, my big sensitivities were soy, gluten, eggs, dairy, corn. And the only two things that I can't eat um, would be soy and gluten. Um, yeah. Other than that, I don't get, because like I would lose my eyesight in minutes from eating eggs or dairy wow. and that doesn't happen anymore. I still don't eat dairy um, regularly, but, and mm -hmm. I know it's not on the walls protocol, so I don't talk about it a lot because it really hurts people. But if I want to eat dairy, I can eat dairy with no negative yeah. effects. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, Go ahead. 
that's where I think every protocol should be like tailored. People are like, well, you follow the walls protocol perfectly, right? And they're like, no, it's been five years. I follow the Beth protocol. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah I have, see what works for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have figured out what I can eat, like what makes me thrive and every person that is so different. Yeah. I like to tell people too, like I, I consider myself in remission, but I also know how to, if I were wanted to be sick, I know what I would do because if I started eating what everyone else eats or high sugars and yeah, gluten all the time, I'd be sick like that. So I would, I would never, you know, I would be sick still, yep. but, um, you have to keep working at it yeah and stress is huge and you can't you can't avoid stress yeah. in everyday life but you can learn how to breathe and you can yeah. learn how to just go you know what i'm letting it go yeah that's, <laughs> that's been a big thing in my life too of letting things go <laughs> who cares if the house is messy but i got my snuggles in today with my kids you know and that's yep. more important and letting yeah. people go, letting people go that aren't beneficial in your life and are not like that was a hard one. But one yeah. day, activities, really too activities. I think a lot of people that I've noticed that have Lyme are people that are like go getters, like go go go. They're the people that you call when you want stuff done, and you know they're gonna get stuff done, and they're like go 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 all the time, and then they get smack, and they're you know they're useless for a little while until they heal. But you gotta learn. And I talk a lot about that in my, my Facebook group is like, let it go. Like, it's okay. I don't keep up with your neighbors. Don't keep up with all the activities that you think you're supposed to be doing. Cause those people, they're just running themselves ragged and you don't have extra energy to expend on that kind of stuff. You got to work on, you know, healing is a lot of energy that you need right there. That is good advice. <laughs> yeah. I let go a lot I of people in my life. Sometimes. <laughs> I remind myself sometimes, oh, wait, I can say no to that. Okay. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes you have to be set like, or then there's nothing wrong with being selfish because if you're not taking care of you, you can't take care of anybody around you. For sure. Yeah. And as you know, we are moms, so like we don't have a choice to be <laughs> completely selfish, but you do yeah. still have to take care of you so you can take yeah. care of them. Yep. That's self love. Yep. And okay. I, you so know, now Tell us, I guess, what, so what do you do? Like, how has Lyme changed your life as far as, well, we hear all the health good things, but now this is, this is your practice, this is your business now. You're helping others. You know, I love, I love who I am now. I don't think, like, I look back at my whole life, I don't think I liked who I was before. Like, oh. I always seemed like a happy person, I think. Um, and I could smile, you know, I can smile with the best of them, even when I was sick. Like, you won't find a picture of me looking because I didn't take a picture if I wasn't smiling, like, and we didn't have Facebook back then and selfies and like, I'm kind of glad about that really. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know what, I love who I am now. I love helping other people. I love teaching people about nutrition. Um, I love just, I love just listening to people and letting them be who they are. Like what did somebody was saying one day, um, they got a business coach, she does what I do. And the business coach said, well, you need to charge more money. And she's like, no, like, I don't want to be too expensive. I just want to help people. And she's mm -hmm. like, oh, so you're just helping people so that you feel good about it. That's kind of selfish, don't you think? <laughs> I like, well, I guess so. Like, I guess you could call it completely selfish then, and I'm totally okay with it. Because when somebody, like, just sends me a message and is like, thank you so much. I feel so yeah. good. And that is the best feeling in the entire world. Like, yeah, yeah. Because when you're sick for that long, you know how much it sucks to be sick. And, like, yeah. it does suck. Yeah. Um, but, so, yeah, feeling good feels good. And I'll be, like, there's some, like, I can't, I can't spend a lot of time with people who are super negative. Um, and I feel bad. I know that they need help. And, like, but if you're not willing to help yourself, like, I can't help you. Yep, yep. That's good. Yeah. Um, so I need positivity in my life. And then, so, so I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner. And then I also did a program with Dr. Tom O'Brien um, and became a certified gluten practitioner. Mm -hmm. And that guy, do you know who Tom O'Brien is? Yeah. If you, yeah. If anybody reads the autoimmune fix, it definitely doesn't, you don't want to take a bite of gluten ever in your life again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in his series, Betrayal, that was an amazing series. If you can still find that, I think you can find it on YouTube, watch it. And that was like the first time that I heard main, not mainstream doctors, because they're all kind of functional medicine doctors, but really talk about Lyme disease 
being the trigger for most of these autoimmune diseases. And not always, like it's not, and I know that some people believe all MS is Lyme disease. I don't believe that. I believe a lot of it is. Um, but I believe that there are, there's other virus, there's other toxins, there are many other things in this world creating autoimmune disease. But Lyme disease is one of the big ones. Um, but yes, so he is he is amazing and like sitting in his class, like he actually, he gets a little teary eyed when he talks about his personal stories with gluten and like when he really figured it out and he just, he is a, such a kind man and just a good man. Watch his YouTube videos, they are good. Um, and then I also was so lucky um, to meet Dr. Walls at a conference. And then I kind of stalked her afterwards and made myself very well known to her. <laughs> and now I actually, I work for her Okay. and um, do work just online. I do stuff for her and that is awesome being a part of her team. Um, she has a great certification too, to be a Walls health professional, which is great. Um, and yeah, I just, I can talk food all day long. I also try to work in my local community and help farmers and make sure that pe people know where they can find local food. Um, so I do, like, I have a local food page to help people with that. I think farming is a super, if I love food, like, we have to support those people that bring us our food. Yep. Um, so we actually recently, we had a really nice little house in Bend, Oregon, and life was pretty simple. And we sold that nice little house and we bought 10 acres of land with no house. And mm -hmm. we live in an RV and we raise sheep. We just built the chicken coop. Um, we will be butchering our first sheep in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And that will be super hard because those are our, like, we love our sheep. We name them all, which we probably need to stop doing. Um, <laughs> and, but they are for meat. I want to know that my meat is the best meat that I can find. I truly, I think, your meat needs to be grass fed. Um, chickens can eat grains, but la lamb and cows are not meant to eat grains. Yeah, yeah. And it completely changes, even if they just have grains for a month of their life, it completely changes the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. And if you only have an omega-6 in your beef, then that is an inflammatory food. Mm -hmm. If you have a balance between omega-3 and omega-6, I don't think that meat is an inflammatory food and is horrible for you. Um, like, I have a lot of vegans that get really upset with me <laughs> that I eat meat and think I'm not a compassionate person. Um, and I find that really sad because... Yeah. I'm one of those oddballs out there where I... I'm vegan. That would just work well for me. But my family eats meat, and I totally support. I support them hunting, and we raise our own meat when we can. Um, but I'm one. We'll be out there, and I'll, I hunt. Um, I don't really have a problem. Um, I know it's going to my family, and they're eating really clean meat. So some people, you know, got after me because I posted things on Pinterest of me out hunting this fall. But yeah, I might taste it, but I don't. Just my body doesn't do well with it for whatever reason. But um, I have no problem, you know, supporting my family and having good, clean meat for them. I think definitely better than that factory, farm, you know, farm stuff. Um, yeah. I told, like, they will wish, like, I will have people say, well, I can't wait till you get cancer and die. Oh. And I'm like, excuse me, like, you're doing that because I don't have compassion for animals? Do you have compassion for me? Like, I was a vegan and I was not healthy. Yeah. And, you know, I had 30 brain and spine lesions. The myelin yeah. that is affected by that is saturated fat and cholesterol is what that brain is made of. I would not have healed 30 brain lesions on a vegan diet. Yeah. My brain needs fat and cholesterol. Like it's just, and so I just, I don't see the compassion in wanting humans to be sick so that you can, so animals yeah. can live. That's not compassionate to me. Yeah. Um, if, if vegan makes you feel good, then you should be a vegan. Yeah. But, but not, it, I see so many, I, I um, did a video a little while back and it was, I think I labeled it something to get at someone's attention, but it was like why the vegan diet's not the best for autoimmune issues. And that's, and the reason I go into that is saying it's because most typical vegans are cooked vegan with lots of grains and we're not meant to be eating those grains. We really aren't. And so you can say you're, you know, people are say they're vegan, but they're still not, they're not getting the nutrients that they need. And so it's, it's more, that's why I really support um, the walls protocol, even though, you know, my family, when well, my husband follows it, 
and I follow a lot of it, but I, I don't do some of the meat things, but I support it fully. And I tell people, get the book, read it. It's going to change because she is so um, good at explaining how important it is to get those nutrients, get the colors in, get all the different minerals and vitamins. And that's, you know, so not all paleo books go into that um, no. and how important it is. And she even talks a lot about those raw vegetables because the enzymes are still alive in there. And, yeah. Um, so, I mean, it but, is, I think for someone who can go from a standard American diet, it's a little easier to go definitely into the, the walls, um, protocol, the paleo diet. Yeah. Well, and I like her paleo diet is veggie heavy. I like veggies, Yeah. yeah. but for some, like when your digestion is off and you have SIBO, you can't necessarily eat the raw veggies until you fix yeah. your digestion. Like there's yeah. so much healing that has to happen to eat an ideal diet. Does that make sense? <laughs> like, yeah. And in today's world, so many people have digestive dysfunction. Yeah. And you really have to just kind of figure things out and listen to your body. That's a huge thing I talk to people about, too, is listening to your body. And Because, yeah, there's not a diet or a protocol or a medicine or something that's right for every single person out there. We wouldn't all be suffering, whether it's Lyme or any other inflammatory disease. Um, but you have to just really listen. And also, I feel like as soon as you figure out, like, oh, this is working really well, all of a sudden you're like, oh wait, now my body's saying like, I need to work on this area. You know, like I could handle broccoli, but now all of a sudden I can't, you know, and digestion is like you said, so key in that. Well, you know, when did my histamine issue actually happen right after I got that gluten in Portland is huh. when I was eating um, leftover chicken and all of a sudden I had the worst headache and I asked some lady next to me because it was a nutritional therapist conference and I wasn't a nutritional therapist yet. I said, what is this? And she said, was well, it leftovers? And I said, it is. And she's like, it's histamine because it's, it's older stuff. And I was like, oh, that's not good. And then all of a sudden spinach started giving me a headache. My lemon water in the morning gave me a headache because that's high histamine. And I was like, I'm not okay. Like, I'm not giving up spinach. I'm not giving up lemons. Like, these are healthy foods. I'm going to fix this. And it took, it really only took a few months to fix it. And like even histamine, and this is one that so many people will not try because they, it's just too simple, but water, a lot of just little histamine issues can be fixed. Water flushes out your histamines. Hmm. If you're a little bit dehydrated, your histamine is just sitting in your body. Wow. Flush your body with water. Sometimes you need to add a pinch of real salt to your water so that you're actually absorbing that. Yeah. Um, better but what is there's a great book out there the body's many cries for water and oh. this doctor he's like 70 percent of all emergency room visits just need water oh wow and i gotta write, I write that book down which one's that one <laughs> um the many cries for water the body's many cries for water and it really is true dehydration causes headaches causes joint pain it the list of things that dehydration and just being like you can be mildly dehydrated for years and years and years of your life and you'll yeah. never know it because that's just your normal. Yeah. yeah. But it's. Yeah. And I'll put those links for people who are watching um, or will be watching this. I'll put links down below so we don't have to memorize the books. Okay. <laughs> but dehydration is huge. Um, I know just taking a short, a little bit off subject, but dehydration, taking a short car trip over the weekend um, to Idaho and back. My little guy didn't, he's kind of at home guy. Like he's, he's only two, but he didn't drink enough water. And, um, we don't give our kids like juice very often. And he just wasn't drinking enough water. We were driving a lot at people's houses a lot, just really busy. And he came back and he got, you know, fever and he got, like, I can tell histamine issues because his face got a little swollen and puffy. He's like, Oh no, what did he eat? But I realized that he was dehydrated. And so poor guy, he just, he didn't sleep a lot because he was fever, you know, fever, but he didn't drink water like all night and the next day he was better. Good. But it was dehydration and just like, oh my goodness, it wrecks havoc on us for sure. Yeah. It can be, sometimes things can be an easy fix, but like when, when I say the water thing to most people with histamine issues, they just, they won't even try it because it sounds too simple. Yeah. And it does give hope. I, I feel like there's a lot of people out there with Lyme who say, I have such a limited diet and it's so frustrating and I can't have this and can't have that. But I think, you know, you're showing us that there is hope that if you work on your gut issues, you can slowly add in some of those things that are still healthy, of course. We're not saying go back to donuts and and <laughs> that kind of stuff and gluten, but you can heal your body to be able to add more healthy things. Like you're saying spinach, 
in lemon, like some people might not be able to have that now, but if they heal their gut, they can be able to add more healthy things back into their diet that maybe right now they just can't deal with it. Absolutely. There's um, Dr. Ben Lynch too, just came out with, he has a new supplement um, for histamine issues. And I think it sounds really promising because that is, that is, it's, it's horrible and it cuts out yeah. on so many foods you can eat. And, but yeah, I really truly believe we can heal our bodies. Yeah. And so, and you're saying most histamine issues are really a gut issue, right? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it all, like Hippocrates said years ago, all disease begins in the gut. And I think it is yeah. a huge, yeah. huge yeah. thing. And it is nice. Like mainstream medicine is slowly, slowly catching up to that. Yeah. I shouldn't yeah. even, yeah. Slowly. Slowly. <laughs> slowly. <laughs> Yeah, and it's something I, I never really realized really until I got really sick of how important, you know, that gut and the gut brain connection was <laughs> with the whole with anxiety and rage and all that stuff and anger and depression really was a gut issue. It really is. Yeah. I didn't get that. I missed that somewhere in my life. Um, but until I was learning, you know, all these things you're learning and researching as you're dealing with Lyme and all its many symptoms, um, that's I really made that really, you know, rang home rang true to me that um you know your gut has so much to do with just you know a lot of that big the brain connection as they're mumbling through my words <laughs> and, and a toxic liver like if your liver is you can then get on the very best diet but if your liver is a little toxic like you have to cleanse that liver and get your detox pathways working so you can get rid of all of that stuff because that is anger comes a lot from a toxic liver mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, you know, once you start, like you just, you learn so much and it's a constant thing. I will never stop learning about healing and like, yeah, it's yeah. a constant. Yeah. Well, let's wrap up here, but um, I want to let everyone know that Beth um, has a website and we'll link that below and she's available for in office, but also Skype, right? Yes. Okay, for nutritional therapy. Um, lots of knowledge. I'm sure she could probably keep going and teaching us things, um, you know, for hours. And I would listen for hours. Um, and so check it out. Um, check out her um, Facebook page and her website. And if you're looking for someone, a lot of even Lyme literate doctors are not teaching nutrition. They're really not. They might recommend something. They say, oh, go gluten free, sugar free. But you know, sometimes you need more than that. You need someone to really work with you one on one to say, what are your issues? What are your symptoms? Someone who's trained like Beth to be able to look at your whole body, your whole experience, and what deficiencies you have or what um, you need to be working on. And so, yeah, check out her website. And um, we'll just wrap it up and say thanks, everyone, for watching. Hopefully, you learned a lot. Uh, feel free to share the video with anyone who you think could use the information. And it's not really just for Lyme or MS people. I mean, anyone out there, that's almost everyone nowadays, but anyone who's dealing with an inflammatory disease of any type, um, even just arthritis, as simple as that, um, people can, can you know, ha be helped um, by dealing with anti-inflammatory stuff and just their foods can heal you. So thanks, you guys, for watching. And thank you, Beth, for being here. I really appreciate your time and your energy and sharing all your wisdom that you have for us. So thank you. Thank you, Heather. Okay, bye everybody. <laughs>